So today we are going to look at the worksheet that is labeled, what is a plant? Now you should have some basic idea of what a plant is. Like, you know, it's green because it has chlorophyll in it. And you know, it's an autotroph, which means it makes its own food. But to be a plant, you actually have to fit some pretty specific definitions. So on your page there that says, what is a plant? That first thing, as you should know, is that all plants are eukaryotes. Remember, if you're a eukaryote, that means you have a nucleus. If you're a prokaryote, you're a bacteria. Right? All plants have a nucleus. Right? Also, as you guys know, they are all multicellular. This is why certain types of algae can't be called plants. Now, what you think of as seaweed, seaweed is an algae, it's not a plant. Because by definition, to be a plant, as you're going to see, you have to have leaves. And to be a leaf, you have to have certain layers. To be a root, you have to have certain layers. Well, seaweed have things that look like leaves, and they have things that look like roots, but they don't have the same layers. So we can't call them plants, even though they're multicellular. But a lot of your algae is actually unicellular, which is why it cannot be in this group. Okay. And also, you guys know, if you're a plant, you're an autotroph. And remember, autotrophs mean that you make your own food. Plants do photosynthesis. They have chloroplasts. They're green because of the chlorophyll that's inside of them. Okay. So we probably... Um, as far as evolution is concerned, got plants from green algae. Green algae are eukaryotic. Okay. Seaweed, green seaweed is multicellular. They are autotrophs. And also there's other characteristics that green algae share. Now there's lots of different types of algae. Algae is classified according to its color. So there's brown algae, there's red algae, there's yellow algae, there's orange algae, which is called pyrophyta, it's my favorite. But green algae, they all have cell walls, but different types of algae have different things in their cell walls. Or obviously brown algae doesn't have a lot of chlorophyll. Red algae doesn't have a lot of chlorophyll. So we believe that plants came from our friends green algae. So just some shared characteristics. I'm sorry that this is shaking. But like I said, they all have cell walls made of cellulose. Remember cellulose is the sugar. OSC at the end of the word means it's a sugar. And cellulose is basically like the bones of a plant. You guys have all eaten celery before, and you know, you peel off those strings and you chew them and chew them and chew them and they don't go away. Well, that's because the skin of celery is almost pure cellulose. It's strong, it's tough, it helps them stand up. And since we don't have an appendix, we can't break down cellulose. But brown algae doesn't have cellulose in its cell walls. Red algae doesn't have cellulose in its cell walls, but green algae does. Also, obviously, they're green. They have chlorophyll in them. If you remember, it's the green pigment that we need in order to do photosynthesis. Well, not us, but like red algae. Red algae is not green. Red algae doesn't have chlorophyll in it. Okay. Carrots. Okay. Carrots aren't green. Okay. So carrots don't do photosynthesis. They have something called carotene in it. So orange algae has carotene in it. Red algae, not red. I mean, it's not, excuse me, it's not green. Doesn't have chlorophyll in it. Green algae does. Plants have chlorophyll. Green algae has chlorophyll. And they all store food as a starch. Okay. All plants make sugar, but like you store fat, plants will store starch for like, think of it as the winter time when they're hibernating, just like bears will eat and eat and eat and get really fat. So when they hibernate, they basically feed off their body fat. Well, around here in the winter time, plants lose their leaves. So plants can't do photosynthesis, so plants are kind of hibernating. So they have to have a lot of sugar stored up in order to be able to survive the winter. Well, they, they store their food as starch. Something like brown algae, which is kelp, they store theirs as a weird kind of oil. So again, different types of algae don't fit a lot of the characteristics that we see in plants other than green algae. Now, Obviously, algae lives in water. So algae doesn't have to worry about drying out. Algae doesn't have to worry about when is it going to get its water because, you know, all living things need water. But at some point in time, remember, evolution is all based on mutations. So at some point in time, this plant-like structure was created, and it had a mutation, and that mutation allowed it to live on land. So nature's like, okay, well, let me check this out for a little while. They're like, oh, hey you can't dry out. Or, oh, hey, you don't have to float in water. So over time, different adaptations have adapted. 
So for example, oops, sorry. Plants on land have to worry about water loss, okay, evaporation. So all plants have a layer of dead cells on their surface. And that layer is called a cuticle. You have a cuticle. Now, usually when you think about cuticles, you just think about your fingernails. Okay. Your entire body, the entire top layer of your skin is dead. Dead cells don't need water. So you don't have to worry about water evaporating from your skin. Now, this is different from sweat. But you also have a cuticle. When you touch your skin, you are touching your cuticle. It is a layer of dead cells. Dead cells don't need water, so you don't have to worry about them drying out. Also, they carry out photosynthesis, so they have leaves. And you're like, well, seaweed has things that look like leaves. Well, to be a leaf, you have to have certain parts. You have to have something called a spongy mesophyll. You have to have something called a palisade mesophyll. You just have to have things called stomata. You have to have things called guard cells. Okay. Well, green algae doesn't have those. So at some point in time, this plant was made and it had this mutation that gave it this weird layer of cells. And that layer of cells allowed it to store water. Or it gave them this weird layer of cells and it allowed the cells to hold even more chloroplast. So remember, these are all mutations that have developed over time. Also, plants need to anchor into the soil. And so plants have roots. And to be a root, you have to have certain layers. And also to be a root, you have to not only hold the plant in place, you have to absorb water. Well, you guys are like, well, some seaweed is at the bottom of the ocean. And so they have something holding them in place. Yes, but we can't call them roots because they don't absorb water and they don't have the same layers. And last but not least, plants have developed something called transporting materials, which is called vascular tissue. Now, anytime you see vascular, vascular always means a tube. You and I have a vascular system. Those are all of our blood vessels. We have arteries, veins, capillaries. Well, plants don't have blood. Plants don't have blood vessels, but plants do have tubes that they use to move things through. So you have a vascular system. Some plants have a vascular system. You have blood vessels. Plants, as you're going to see, have two tubes called xylem and phloem. But anytime you see vascular tissue, these are tubes that things use to move things around. So some plants can get really tall because they have a tube that acts like a straw to suck water up from the roots all the way to the top. So vascular tissue is going to be tubes that things have to move around. So vascular tissue is actually one way that we take all the plants in the world and divide them up into groups. So we can talk about these two things called plant categories. First of all, obviously, vascular plants. So if you're a vascular plant, you have these tubes. Okay? And you can use these tubes like blood vessels to move things around. Well, you have arteries, which carries blood away from the heart, and you have veins, which carries blood to the heart. So arteries and veins, they move in opposite directions. Well, plants can have two tubes that move in opposite directions. One tube is going to move down, and that tube is going to transport food. Because remember, food is sugar, and the sugar are made at the leaves, so the sugar has to go all the way down to the roots to feed them. And then water moves up the plant because water comes from the soil, but the leaves need the water for photosynthesis. So you're going to have a tube that carries water all the way up the plant. So just like humans have arteries and veins, which move in opposite directions, plants have what are called xylem and phloem, which are going to move in opposite directions. You might want to put where it says food in parentheses. You might want to put what's called phloem. That's P-H-L-O-E-M. P-H-L-O-E-M. Phloem are the tubes that plants have that move food. Oh, my phone is ringing, but I'm going to ignore it. And then we have water. With water, you might want to put xylem. X-Y-L-E-M. Xylem are the tubes that they use to transport water. So they're going to go up the plant. And that phone can just keep on ringing because I'm not going to answer it. And then you have plants that are non-vascular plants. Okay. 
meaning they don't have tubes. So if you think about it, not all animals have arteries and veins. Jellyfish. Jellyfish don't have arteries and veins. They don't have blood. Okay. Sponges. Sponges don't have arteries and veins. They don't have blood. So not all animals have tubes in them. Not all plants have tubes in them. So we can take plants and divide them up based on whether or not you have these tubes. So if you don't have these tubes, you're called non-vascular. If you do have these tubes, you're called vascular. Now, non-vascular are going to be the lowest of the low as far as plants go. Okay. They're going to be the most basic type of plant you can have. Most of the plants that you think of when you think of plants are going to be this group right here. Okay. They are the ones that we see around here. Non-vascular plants, since they don't have tubes, they can't be that far away from water. They can't be very big. Okay. So most of the trees and bushes that you think of are going to be this group here. So with non-vascular plants, since they don't have these tubes, they have to use diffusion and osmosis to get food and water into the different cells. They can't be very big. They don't have tubes. So it's like if I give the front row M&Ms and say, hey, take as many M&Ms as you want and then pass the bag back. By the time the bag got to the back row, it would be empty. And if you were cells, you'd starve. So these guys can't get very big because they're going to have to get all their nutrients through diffusion and osmosis. All right. Now, with plant reproduction, we're going to skip this one. So just excuse me for a second. I'm going to go through here. Oh, no, that's on there. So with plant reproduction, we're going to talk, when we do this unit, we're going to talk about something called spores. And spores are basically diploid structures that fall to the ground and then they look like pollen or they look like salt and pepper and they grow into a brand new plant. Okay. Well, later in newer plants are going to use seeds, which we talk about. So it says, what specialized structures did plants develop that aided in reproduction? Well, those are going to be seeds. Okay. You have three parts to a seed. To be a seed, you have to have three parts. So somewhere on your page, I want you to write the word seed. And I want you to write the three parts to a seed. To be a seed, you have to have an embryo. And an embryo is the baby plant. To be a seed, you have to have a food source. Because something, the baby plant has to eat off of something until it can grow leaves and do photosynthesis. And that food source is called an endosperm. E-N-D-O sperm. S-P-E-R-M. And then to be a seed, you have to have what's called a seed coat. A seed coat is a protective layer around the baby seed and its food source. And if you have a seed, you're a fruit. Peas, peas are seeds. So a pea pod is a fruit. Cucumbers have seeds. So the cucumber is a fruit. Watermelon, obviously a fruit. Squash a fruit. Peppers, a fruit. We'll talk more about that later. But if you're a seed, you have three parts to you. The embryo, which is the baby plant. The endosperm, which is the food source, because the baby plant has to eat something while it's still a seed. And this thing called a seed coat. And all plants go through this really complicated thing called alternation of generations, okay, which is easier to just explain it later. Okay. But on your sheet, it says define alternations of generations. So here's a definition. Okay. This is a life cycle where an organism alternates between a haploid gametophyte stage and a diploid sporophyte stage. Okay. Now, when something is haploid, that means it has half the genetic information. If you're diploid, you have two sets of the genetic information. Well, if something is haploid, it can only make egg and sperm. And egg and sperm are called gametes. Anytime you see fight at the end of the word, you have a plant or an algae. So a gametophyte is a haploid structure. It has half the DNA that makes egg and sperm. A sporophyte is a diploid structure. It has two sets of DNA and it's going to make these things called spores. So instead of this video going into great detail about that, we will go over that in more detail later. Right. So.
That is the worksheet labeled, What is a Plant? You should now find the worksheet that says Plant Diversity on it. There are so many different types of plants in nature. I mean, tons of plants in nature. We had to have some way of dividing them up into groups. Well, one way, does it have tubes or not? We've already talked about that. You could be vascular, you could be non-vascular. Or do you make seeds? Not all plants make seeds. So with all these different types of plants, we've had to figure out a way to divide them up. So you're looking for the page that says plant diversity. And on that sheet, you can see the ways that we divide plants up. First of all, non-vascular plants. These are the most basic kind of plant you can be. These are the lowest of the low as far as plants go. They have no vascular tissue. So they don't have any tubes that can carry things around in them. So they have no xylem, they have no phloem, they cannot get very big, they're not very complex, they're the most basic kind you have. They're small in size and they have to live close to water because they don't have any straws inside of them to suck water up. They have to live really, really close to water. And this is the group called division bryophyta. Anytime you see division in front of the word, it has a cell wall. So that's a clue. So if your question is talking about an animal and you see division as a choice, you might not have a clue what that means. But you know a division has a cell wall, so it can't be an animal. Bryo means small, and phyta always means you have a plant or an algae. So this is basically letting you know that these are going to be small plants. All right, so these are the most basic of the basic. These are the mosses like you're used to seeing growing. And if you think about where moss grows, it grows in places that where the soil is pretty soggy. Well, at some point in time, a plant was created, and it had a mutation that gave them these tubes. So they became vascular plants. Vascular plants, remember, have those tubes that they can move things back and forth with. And the first plants probably didn't have seeds yet. If you don't, you're like, okay, well, if you don't have a seed, what do you do? Well, these guys create eggs, and they create sperm. And they have to be in water because sperm has to swim. So they'll drop their eggs, they'll drop their sperm, they'll come together, and they make a baby plant. With these guys, they don't have seeds either. Okay. So they still have to live near water because they still make sperm, and that sperm's got to be able to swim. Okay. And so these are things called club mosses, horsetails, and ferns. Okay. Now on your sheet, you'll see these funky names, Lycophyta, that's a horse, that's a club moss, Sphenophyta, that's a horsetail, and Terophyta, those are ferns. And most of you have seen ferns before. They do contain vascular tissue. So they do have these tubes that are like our blood vessels. Now, they don't have blood vessels, they don't have blood. But they do have tubes that move things around. And I mentioned these tubes before. You have xylem. Xylem are, dead, are tubes made from dead cells that transport water up from the roots. I'm just going to ignore that phone. They have to be dead so they don't use up all the water. And then you have phloem, which are living cells that transport the sugar. Phloem have to be alive because sugar is so big. You have to use that sugar. Those cells have to be alive to move, those that, move that sugar around. Okay. But xylem would be like, let's say, our veins, because they move up our body. And phloem would be like our arteries. They're going to carry stuff down. But these would be like the blood vessels of the plant. Xylem is going to move water up. Phloem is going to move water down, or excuse me, sugar down. And they do have roots and stems, which we'll talk about what it means to be a root, what it means to be a stem later. And so this guy right here, it's called a horsetail. Some cultures use it as a broom. This is the fern like you're used to. And this guy right here is called a club moss, just so you can see what they look like. Now, Seedless plants still have to be in water to reproduce okay? because they still have these sperm. They have to swim in water. The egg has to stay wet. Okay? But seed plants do not have to be near water because seed plants make pollen. And pollen has two cells inside of it. And pollen actually has a sperm cell inside of it. And the pollen keeps that sperm cell safe. It doesn't have to swim. It can be picked up by rain, it can be picked up by water, it can be picked up by an animal, it can be picked up by wind, but seed plants do not have to be near water. So seed plants can grow a whole bunch of different places. So seed plants are, 
probably what you think of when you think of a plant. Now with seed plants, we divide them into two groups. Now to be a seed, remember you have to have three parts. You have to have the baby plant, which is the, endo, which is the embryo. You have to have, have food source, which is the endosperm. And then you have to have some type of protective coat around it. Well, we take seed plants and we divide them up into two groups based on the seed coat. The first guy here is called a gymnosperm. These are conifers. That's what you're used to. These are plants that make cones, like pine cones, okay. um, gumballs. Okay. Well, the pine cones and the gumballs actually have seeds inside of them. Okay. Right. Sperm is the word that we use for seed. Gymno means naked. These guys make seeds. Okay. They're an embryo. They're an endosperm, but one, excuse me, lots of seeds share one seed coat. So a pine cone is actually the seed coat, and there's lots of baby plants and food source on the inside of it. Right. When you think of a peanut, a peanut is not a gymnosperm. A peanut is a seed. The nut, the shell, is a seed coat. Right. An apple seed has a shell on it. A sunflower seed has a shell on it. Well, gymnosperm, the name means naked seed because each baby plant does not have its own blanket protecting it. It would be like me taking all of you and wrapping you in one big blanket and that one big blanket protects you. Well, that's what the cone is. That's going to be, that's what, going to be what protects it. They do have vascular tissue. They have those tubes. And like I said, they produce seeds inside of cones. And they will produce pollen that is carried by the wind. If you have a flower on you, you are a group of plants called angiosperms. Okay. Angiosperms make fruits. Okay. Ginkgo sperms, or excuse me, um, gymnosperms make cones to protect their seeds. Angiosperms make fruits to protect their seeds. When you eat the fruit, you are eating the reproductive organ of the plant. And the seed is inside of it. If you are a plant that makes a flower, you make a fruit. If you have a seed, you are a fruit. If you're a vegetable, you're a root, a stem, or a leaf. Carrots are roots, they're vegetables. Lettuce are leaves, it's a vegetable. Peppers have seeds in them, it's a fruit. And so if you are a plant that makes a flower, you are called an angiosperm. Okay. So they have flowers to help efficiently transfer gametes. Remember, gametes are the egg and sperm. Just in the case of these guys, the sperm doesn't have to swim. The sperm is carried in pollen. Okay. And you guys know that pollen is carried by these things called pollinators. Okay. You would be a pollinator if pollen sticks to you. Okay. And like I mentioned, seeds develop inside of protective fruits that aid in dispersal. Most plants today are in this group. So last thing on your sheet, we had to figure out a way of taking this group and dividing it into smaller chunks. So we look at the baby plant. And we have on your sheet what are called monocotyledons and what are called dicotyledons. Okay, let me just first stress you guys know mono means one. A cotyledon is a baby leaf. Because you guys all know how plants come out of the ground. Well, when the plant comes out of the ground, it better have a leaf or it's going to starve. You guys have all planted leaf seeds before and they just didn't grow. Well, they probably ran out of food before they ever popped out of the earth. Well, when that plant pops out of the earth, it better have a seed. Oh, excuse me, it better have a leaf so we can start doing photosynthesis. So if when you're born, you only have one little leaf to start photosynthesis with, you're called a monocot. Okay? And these are things like corn, grass, different grains, tulips, daffodils. Right? And again, they get their name because they have one cotyledon, one of these little baby leaves. If you look at their leaf, they have veins in them. Now, their veins are different from our veins. Their veins are actually xylem and phloem running side by side. Their veins are actually made from two tubes. One tube is carrying sugar and one tube is carrying water. But their veins go up and down. 
So you guys, you know, you can Google a picture of corn, right? or you can Google a piece of grass. And you know, their veins, all their stripes on their leaves all go up and down, up and down. That's what we call parallel leaves. Their roots, they don't have like one really big root. Their roots divided into all these different fibers. And their flowers are in parts, their flower parts are in multiples of three. And later you're going to learn the parts of a flower. But if you, and the parts of the flower usually, like if you have, you're going to have things called petals and sepals. Well, if you have six sepals, you're probably going to have six petals. And so... Their vascular bundles are scattered throughout the stem. And I'm going to show you a picture of what I'm talking about. Oh. So here, you've got one baby, here you've got one baby seed. Here you can see you've got the veins and they go up and down. Vascular bundles and veins are the same thing. We call them veins in a leaf. We call them vascular bundles in a stem or a root. And vascular bundles are made from xylem and phloem. It's like having two straws together. And if you cut into the stem, they're just all over the place. There's your fibrous root system. So they don't have one really big root. They have a bunch of little ones. And then their floral parts are usually in multiples of three. Now, some plants are called dicots. So you guys now know that means that they have two baby seed, baby leaves. And these are fruit trees, roses, daisies, azaleas, just some examples. They have two cotyledons. They have branching leaf veins. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. They have a tap root system, which means they have one really big root and other little roots grow off of it. And their floral parts are in multiples of four or five. And their vascular bundles are nice and organized and they form a ring. So here you can see ver parallel veins. Those are the branching ones. So monocots, the bundles are just all over the place. Dicots, the bundles are in a nice ring. Monocots have a fibrous root system, lots of little roots. Dicots have a tap root system, one long root, one large root with little roots coming off of it. Flowers are in multiples of three. Flowers in multiples of four or five. So if you got a flower that had 15 petals on it, you couldn't tell me if it was a monocot or dicot because 15 is a multiple of 3 and 15 is a multiple of 5. So you would have to look at other parts to figure out what you have. So at this point in time, you should have all of the what is the plant worksheet filled in and you have all of the plant diversity worksheet filled in.